Welcome to the Red White News Show with Dean McMurray from Military Media. Hey everybody, welcome back to another great episode of the Red, White, and You show with yours truly, the Military Medium. Hey, today I have a great guest on. Um, you might recognize him by some of his uh, more recent uh, projects, and we're going to get into that in a minute. But Rod Lurie, um, you know, Rod has um, is the son of an internationally syndicated cartoonist. Um, you know, was born in Israel, moved to the United States at a young age. Um, and he graduated from the United States uh, Military Academy. That's right. He's a ring knocker from West Point. And we don't hold it against him that he was an air defense artillery guy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we love to have him on. He's doing great things um, for awareness and education. And we're going to get into his uh, his his biggest project, the the outpost here in a minute, talking about the Battle of Kamadesh, which is interesting because Rod doesn't even know this, is that I've decided to shift the production calendar uh, for and schedule for the show and actually air this today. And because tomorrow being the 11th, I believe it's the 11th year, right, Rod? Uh, yeah. Anniversary of the Battle of Kamadesh. And I thought, boy, this is this serendipitous of us having this opportunity to do this interview. And, uh, you know, we really need to push this out so it coincides with it um, and, uh, you know, make that happen. But welcome to the Red, White, New Show, Rod. Well, thank you very, very much. Red, White, New. Got it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, kind of go into, I, I, I know, you know, we got, I got all this paperwork on you, but share with the listeners and the viewers a little bit who Rod Lurie is. Well, that's a very loaded question, my man. <laughs> who I am, I'm 58 right. years old. There's a lot of me to talk about. Right. And, I, and I really think that probably you, you are people viewing this and or listening to this really don't care that much. You care probably more about you know, the outpost, the movie, which I just directed, but, you know, you hit some of the, some of the bigger right. points. I'm a um, West Point graduate. I'm a very proud veteran. Um, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I, I will, I will tell you this, that although I'm a veteran, when I graduated in 1984, I graduated into the peacetime army, which means that I never served um, in combat. I was never in the same danger that, uh, that you were in. I was never in the same danger that anybody in my movie was in. And I was never in the same danger that many of my classmates were in. And it's been a, a little bit odd for me. And um, I, 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 I don't know if the word saddening or guilt, guilt-ridden is better, that I keep going back to these reunions. And uh, I'm one of the guys that, um, you know, never had a bullet go past my head. I never fired a bullet at, at uh, an enemy. Mm-hmm. And I suppose that one of the reasons why I wanted to make the outpost which is about the Battle of Kamadesh, is because, you know, if I couldn't join my brothers in arms in the battlefield, the least I could do is to honor them in this way and honoring all soldiers, I think. Right, right. Well, I mean, first and foremost, thank you for your service. And we know that you don't necessarily have to, you, you know, regardless of when you serve is irregardless. It's just a call to serve something right. bigger than ourselves, right? That's right. Because for a lot of us, the reason that we, you know, take that oath. Um, so let's go right into uh, the outpost, um, talking about that. Um, you know, I had the opportunity uh, last night, of course, uh, yesterday being Thursday, uh, October 1st, uh, I hit Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, you it know, did. it's and, on Netflix now, right? Yep. So that was the, the premiere, I guess, uh, premiere of it on that. Um, platform we'll call it now the show act or the movie actually was released in january 3rd correct the movie was released on july the 3rd or sorry july sorry yeah, not january july, july the third yeah. it was yeah. very purposeful release but you know that uh, we were supposed to premiere in actually in march at the south by southwest film festival right. and the covid crisis killed that and then we were supposed to uh screen it 
at West Point, which was going to be a real, um, a real momentous event right. for me because, you know, when I was a cadet and I would sit there in those endless lectures that, that we received, I always swore I'm going to come back one day and I'm going to be on that stage and I'm going to speak to the cadets in some way or other, because I was such a bad cadet that it would just be ironic that I'm the one that's coming back on stage. And, um, but that got killed because all the cadets uh, went home uh, due to the COVID crisis also. And then we were supposed to have on July 1st and 2nd, this mammoth um, across the country uh, screening of the film and uh, the theaters weren't open. So that got killed. So right. we ended up being in, in a few theaters, very small theaters. And then um, we, we premiered on uh, a video on demand on July uh, the 3rd, as you said. And uh, luckily we went to number one pretty quickly and stayed there for the whole month. Right. Absolutely. Now, um, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, um, because a lot of people, if they're not familiar with your work, is that you've been in film uh, for quite some time. Yeah, 20 years. Yeah, about yeah. 20 years, yeah. So, and you were known for more like uh, working with uh, The Last Castle, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with Robert Redford and James Gandolfini and The Line of Fire um, and so many yeah. more, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. TV series. I did. Uh, yeah. Did a lot of political stuff. Uh, the Contender, Nothing But the Truth, Deterrence. And did that also kind of stem? Do you do you believe that it kind of stemmed because you did some time for ABC as well, right? And you were an investigative journalist. Well, I, I was. In, those are two different things. I, oh, okay. I had, Sorry. I had uh, two TV series on ABC. One was called Line of Fire, and the other was right. called Commander in Chief which was Gina Davis starring as the first female president. But uh, before that, I was both a film critic and, and an investigative reporter. Okay. And, you know, I wrote a book, a true crime book, you know, you know, and, and, you know, actually, you know, to, to go back to the West point of it all, you know, I went there knowing that I was going to become a filmmaker at some point. Okay. You know, I, I believe that when you enter college um, that I, I, let, let me back backtrack a bit. If you want to go and become a filmmaker, going to film school, in my opinion, is probably a mistake because you can learn the trade pretty easily or pretty thoroughly when you're on the set and through internships and things sure. like that. What you really should study is what you want to make movies about. And I've always been fascinated since I was a little kid with leadership, with character and with principle. You know, the, these are, you know, the movies that I've been, that I've gravitated to and the movies that I wanted to make. So when I was at the Academy, by the way, my real dream is to make a movie at West Point at some point. They're a tough nut to crack in getting on that, uh, on that <laughs> campus. But I would really like to do that. But, you know, when I was a cadet, I would always ask myself, you know, where would I put the camera? Right. You know, in the, if I was in this room, if I was in this part of the plane, where would I put the camera? And it was a constant question that I asked. So those movies that, and TV shows that you referenced all seem to have these underlying themes. And leadership certainly is one of the themes of The Outpost. Right. Well, and that's very evident, right, is um, with everybody, you know, almost kind of like the total breakdown where you see the continually, um, uh, I guess, a replacement of the commanders. And, right. And everything going on just from the movie. The movie. The movie is um, the, the movie. Very much is broken down into chapters, and the chapters are all based on who was the commander at the time. Right. So you know it. You know it. It begins with um, Keating, right? Who uh, was played is played by Orlando Bloom, and then works its way to Captain Yeskis. and then to uh, Captain Broward, who, by the way, is a fictional name. The only fictional. Uh, the only name that was fictionalized in the movie, okay. and uh, then Bunderman, and then uh, Portis. So you go through the these people, and you and you we evaluate the different leadership styles that each of the men had, and you know, and 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 really to to be truthful, I think that when that battle was fought, the Battle of Kandesh was fought, that it was won by a combination of things, not the least of which was very strong leadership um, right. on the on that base. Well, it was interesting. You talk about that. We go back to the commanders a little bit. And, 
And usually I know for NCOs, but even soldiers, like when did you serve? And a lot of them will go back to, I served under captain or major. So talking about that, who the commander was, or maybe the CEO as well. It's really interesting uh, you, you bring that up because a project that I might be working on is based on a book called Black Hearts. And it's a, it's a, it's a book about um, an atrocity that was committed by American troops in Iraq. And what I find fascinating about that book, which is written by Jim Frederick, Black Hearts it's called, um, shows what can happen to a unit in the absence of leadership, you know, or, or in the presence of really bad leadership. And how important leadership in the chain of command is not just to um, uh, the functioning of a unit, but to um, their prowess and uh, their ability to serve well. Right, right. Well, it's interesting that we see the the different facets of leadership within um, talking about uh, the outpost as far as between mm-hmm. the officer uh ranks and then of course the the enlisted and the ncos and and all those dynamics in there right mm-hmm. as far yeah. well, as the one commander being relieved and the other being more of a uh how do i want to say a negotiator more uh, right they're, they're like the 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 first leader who was uh what was keating who in real life was um an, an executive officer um, he he led by getting in with the troops, with being one of them while still being um, still being above them in a way, a leadership wise. Right. Um, you know, he never talked down. He never talked down to them. He got in among them, but um, there was never any doubt about who was going to lead, and ne- never any doubt about his capabilities. The the third. Uh, the third uh, captain that we show in the film, the guy whose name I changed, and I changed it only because in real life that guy has caught so much shit that I decided I didn't want to contribute to any more right. uh, humiliation for him. He was a guy who, by the time he, Broward, we call him, is played by a magnificent actor named Kwame Patterson. By the time he got to uh, combat outpost Keating, um, many commanders had been killed and they certainly had been targeted. And uh, there was one that we excluded from the film just uh, for, because of the sake of time or the sake of efficiency. But he was scared when he got there and he knew that they were going to close down soon. And he just wanted to get he and his men out of there alive. And so he was always in the top in the tactical operations setup. Right. You know, he was, um, you know, he was constantly, um, um, in fear for his life. When he went to the bathroom, he went with an armed guard, right. you know, over to the to the to the latrines. And I think that there was just feeling that he couldn't function anymore, which is why he was really well. It's interesting you bring that up because I was going to talk. I was going to bring that up about the the fear that he had. He in, in the movie where he was actually urinating in bottles so he didn't have to go right, and then he always had uh, the. The, the one private always taken his, uh, you know, piss bottles out to the burn pit. And, right. um, but one of the, uh, that private talking to, I believe it was the XO at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Special, talking to, yeah. Yep. So yeah. there you go. And, yeah. Special. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, wasn't he awarded a Medal of Honor at the end? He was. Yes. So, and it, uh, but one of the interesting things to me, and a lot of people don't realize it. And a commander told me one time, he was like, McMurray, he was like, commanding an infantry unit is a lot like commanding like a pirate ship. Everything's Whoa. crazy, but if you do it right, everything works well. Right. And I was like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a good analogy. I think it is a good analogy. And I think if you, when you look at our film, you'll see that that's yeah. precisely, what, precisely what was going on there. Right. Well, and and what I loved about it was it it really gave a great synopsis of like a true lifetime shot of of like the enlisted life. Right. Like so always doing um, either wrestling or, you know, what we would say is or whatever. Burning shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like it's, it's, it's yep. and you know, it's interesting how, you know, one of the challenges that I had, Dean, was 
how how part of the movie and part of the life at Keating was boredom, mm, you know, yeah. and that boredom is mostly punctuated when they're shot on, yeah, you know, what you know when they're attacked. Yeah. So how do I make a movie that depicts boredom without making the movie boring? Boring, right? yeah. And so I think that the way to accomplish that is through something that is also very real in most military units that I've been to, in fact, all military units that I've been in, been to, and that is humor yeah. and the thirst to laugh. Wouldn't you say that's true, Dean, that yeah. there's a, you know, we, we crave laughter. It's the only thing, it, it helps us to survive, you know, when, when we're out in these completely shitty places. Absolutely. And although I didn't serve in combat, as I said, I did my share of being in awful places. And so laughter is important. So laughter is a big part of the first half of, uh, of this film. And, you know, we have some, I don't want to say light moments, but certainly, certainly some moments that make you laugh and laugh hard. The thing that I found is, and, and, I, and I believe that the, the film shows us well, is that regardless of the situation soldiers find them in, you, we, we talk about shitty situations, right? So uh, Camp Keating wasn't the, the, the nicest place. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is with American soldiers is regardless, you could be sitting in, uh, you know, somewhere that's not very fun, but at the same time, they're going to find something to, to relieve the stress and relieve the boredom. And that's why a lot of times they know leadership will try to give them mundane tasks to do because they know, number one, a soldier that is bored gets in trouble. That's right. <laughs> and, and, but number two is that's why there's all these and they, they need to be done, number one, but number two, it keeps a routine and keeps complacency out of the uh, threshold, right? And that becomes right. very dangerous. But um, I wanted to go back to the, the commander really quick. And we're talking about the scene with, with all the piss bottles and everything. And, and I remember the conversation um, they were having with the XO talking about where the soldiers were starting to notice where he never left the talk or he did right. under like he had a security <laughs> element. And one of the things that I found is – it doesn't have to be blatant, but soldiers will sniff out when somebody is in this instance where the commander was scared. And mm -hmm. the thing that I, I have also personally found that um, they, it's almost like a unit will tend to eat their own. And mm -hmm. if some, the weakest link, right. Think of like a, a wolf pack or whatever, right. the, the weakest link will tend to be, I don't know, weeded out in a sense. Does that make well, sense? Well, I mean, it is, I, I think that to soldiers, it is simply intolerable yeah. to have, um, you know, a, a commander doesn't, I'm not just talking about officers, I'm talking about in the NCO ranks right. yeah. as well, um, who, is, uh, who is scared or who is feeble or who they don't feel will help keep them, keep them alive. You know, w one of the unfortunate things about um, many of the units that, existed at a time and exist till today in Afghanistan, their primary mission is simply to survive. It's right. to get there and not die. And that should not be a mission of a military unit. I mean, it's right. terrible. And they stated out, they stated very clearly in the film, you know, our mission has always been to survive. And, and that's just unacceptable. So if you have a guy that's running the joint that is not going to make the place survivable, then... Right it's in complete counterbalance to what they need and, and, and what they want. Yeah. And, you know, you know, a lack of respect for the prop for proper leadership right. uh, on, on a unit can be a, an absolute uh, disaster, which is why that guy in the film is weeded out pretty quickly. And he's not, he's a tough guy. I mean, he's, right. this is not, uh, this is not a wuss, you know, uh, the, he, you know, he, he's an athletic built, um, he, in Iraq, he went, he waterboarded himself for almost 10 seconds. I mean, he's got, he had a tough soul, but he, but he was scared and he had family. He wanted to get home to them. And, um, it, it he got, he got, he got relieved. Let's just right. put it that way. And, and you in the film, you'll see for good reason. He really loses his shit. 
Well, and I think that's important thing. You know, we talk about, you know, this commander being scared. And I think there's a difference between being scared and then being scared and acting and still stepping up and having enough courage to. Well, yeah, I mean, to, I mean, to move so, you, right, well. so you, you, you have hit on something, a, a nuance that I, that I probably should have addressed, which is that everybody's scared. Right. It's what they do in the face of that fear that right. determines their character and, and what they do. You know, th- this guy was, uh, was scared and he retreated into right. uh, the talk and into his quarters and into, and like, as you said, had armed guards take him to the shitter. And um, that, you know, that's simply, un- simply unex- unacceptable. You know, you look at like, um, you know, let's take a look at world, at world leaders for a second if we can, okay? Yep. The um, Churchill, you know, would get on the rooftops while Britain was being bombed and would be there and he would observe it and he, and he would be up among the people. It, it was to him untenable that he would not go through the same um, risks as, um, you know, as his people went, went through. Right. And, uh, and so that gave a sense of, um, of honor to the, to the British people. Conversely, you look at, uh, at something, it's the first thing that comes to mind is when you heard about, you know, our current commander in chief retreating into a bunker because there were protesters outside. Now, whether or not that's true or fake news or whatever it is, you know, I won't comment on that, but I will say that it was the source of tremendous criticism for, for, for him. And it was a humiliation for right. him. Mm-hmm. You know, which is why he felt the need to go and cross the street or whatever it was there. And so leaders know that they must be seen as courageous and courageous being defined as not fearless, but acting in the, um, in the, in acting in the face of their, their own fears and the fears of the people uh, below them. Right, right. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's, um, yeah, a great a great point to make as well as far as and and you know and we see that throughout the film as well as people um showing their fear but at the same time even you know I think about a couple of the scenes where you know they're they're trying to get out of room but you know a a, a mortar explodes and throws yeah. them back and they kind yeah. of scream or whatever they do and then they throw themselves almost yeah. literally off the door because it's well, Dean, you're, you're getting into something now, which is, you know, how, how do you, in a movie, portray fear and panic? And I think that Caleb Landry Jones, the actor who plays Ty Carter, who received the Medal of Honor, gives, in my opinion, the best combat performance of all time. And by combat performance, I don't mean performance in a war film. I mean the specific portrayal of a person in the act of combat. And what Caleb manages to do beautifully is to not only internally show that fear and that panic we're talking about, but we see the trigger inside of him that makes him overcome that fear and that panic to act anyway, right? right? And he is so brilliant at it. It's, it's an unbelievable performance, Steve. He, he's one of the best actors in the country, I think, right now. Um. Let me ask: Does he did he serve in any capacity? No, no, he, he no, he did not. Uh, however, uh, one of the, and I got a funny story about that. But one of the crucial things that I asked the studio to do was to allow me to hire as many ex-soldiers, Marines, sailors as I could, and no airmen, but but they would have been eligible to right. uh, to to act in this film. And we have quite a few of them. Quite a few of the actors had been had been veterans. When I met Caleb Landry Jones, if you don't know this, you're more a military guy than a movie guy, right, Dean? That's so, right. Yeah. Okay, so let me just tell you that he, he was in a movie called Get Out okay. and a movie called Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And he's just magnificent in these films, but he, he's very different than this character. And when I met Caleb, Caleb was skinny as olive oil in the Popeye cartoons. He had hair down to his ass. He was high on marijuana and completely not the character. I mean, like so far away, you know, you know, the only way he could have been more different than, uh, uh, 
the real Ty Carter is he, if he was an elderly black woman. I mean, it was just like completely different. Right, and, right. But, you know, he sat there and I, I was, you know, being a director, I evaluate uh, whether or not I think as an actor, he has the chops to completely alter himself to get there. And he promised me that he could. And he went to Austin to meet the real Ty Carter. And Ty called me up and said, this guy's going to the gym, right? I mean, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and I said, trust me. But then there was something that I was not aware of, Dean, which is this. Caleb, and really, you guys, listen, you should go see him and get out and three billboards. He's the guy that gets thrown out the window and three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Um, you know, this is just not him. But Caleb has a brother, and his brother was a Marine in Iraq who lost both his legs. And his brother read the script, and his brother told Caleb, you're doing this fucking movie, <laughs> and you're not gonna fuck it up. And his brother, among others, including our magnificent um, military trainers, uh, got him straight, and he did go to the gym, and he did get into much better, or I don't say better shape, but he, got into uh, much more buff than he was when, when I met him. And by the time he, and, and we put him through boot camp with everybody else. And by the time we were done, he was like perfect for the role. And it would not at all surprise me if he gets nominated for the Academy Award. Wow. No, not at all. You know, it was interesting because when I was watching the movie, I was like, boy, he would fit the, the genre of a thousand specialists or you know that I have when I was a team leader or a squad leader and I was like that's you know when I think you know and maybe I don't know if you're familiar with the term but Joe you know when they would say you know you're yes, Joe's you're, you're, I am I am kind of familiar uh, okay so let me, but, uh, let me two questions Dean what, what was your MOS and uh, an eventual pay grade so I retired as an E7, and I was uh, I had several MOS, MOSs, but for the majority it was uh, infantry. So you were eleven Bravo. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, you know, I was like, boy, that he fits the genre of you know mm -hmm. all the Joes that I've had. Yeah. Yes, and I was like, he he, you know that if I had to describe, put his face and you know, that is, that is him. And, and it was interesting. We talk about having fear and empathy um, and, but yet still having that drive towards the end. Um, actually the scene where the B1 started dropping yeah. their bombs. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, cause it was still really vivid of how uh, it was almost like his eyes were bugging out of his head and it, and, and where you could see where he was crying because, uh, yes. uh, he, you know, here's, he's seen as his best friend lying on the ground, being shot close to dying. And, you know, he's struggling, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and so he had this empathy, but fear. Yeah. Well, you'll have to allow me to, uh, to correct you. Yep. I absolutely. Can't please, do, please do. They were not best friends at all. Stefan Mace, the guy who was crawling on the ground, yep. and he, in fact, were like, not rivals, they were enemies. They hated one another. Okay. And, and in fact, everybody hated uh, Ty Carter. He was really okay. disliked on, on, the, on that base. He was a jerk. He was an asshole. And he will tell you that also, by the way. But Stefan was also his brother. And he was going to go and he was going to get him. In fact, uh, Carter was also very much at odds with a guy that he was in the LRAS with the LRAS two with. And so it was, um, it, it was very significant that he, he thought for sure 90% chance he was going to die trying to save this guy. 90%. Now that didn't happen. Thank goodness. But it, he talked about the eyes, you yeah. know, they might have bulged out. You know, I, I saw those eyes, right. When I was on set, and I decided that I was going to change the lenses in the cameras. I was going to go very wide angle lenses because I really wanted those eyes to pop. And that bulging that you're talking about really gets accentuated by the choice of these close up wide angle lenses. So I was very aware of exactly what you're talking about. And in fact, what you're talking about was enhanced 
by my choice of, of lenses. Mm. Caleb is a very expressive kid, and he's, he really has his shit together as, as, as an actor. And I was able to, like I said, it's through the eyes that you see that so much acting exists. It's through the eyes that you see the panic, that you see the fear, that you see the, the love, and that you, you see the, you see the, the intensity mm. and the propulsion to action. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that where a lot of people express a lot of their emotions and everything as well anyways? I mean, we see it a lot in physical gestures, but a lot through the eyes as well as the old I, adage I, I, of the eyes or the window of the soul, correct? That is exactly correct. And, and, you know, and some of the best actors can do some of their best um, acting through. I've had so many times. I, re I remember once uh, when I was shooting The Last Castle. And Robert Redford had this dialogue that he was supposed to have with Mark Ruffalo. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, I can do this with my eyes. I don't need to say it. And, you know, who am I to question one of the greatest film talents of all right. time? I said, right. okay. And he, went, and he was right. He was completely correct. Absolutely crazy. Interesting. A lot of people don't realize the, the nuances to that. And, you know, it was... In, um, so when you're watching, if you're, again, I'll use the term, a regular Joe like myself watching, just watching the film, but connecting to that raw emotion coming from him. Yes, sir. And in a sense, again, the eyes. Right. It's like, wow, you know, that uh, something that really, really yeah, moved. And, and see, also when they're on the litter as well, or carrying the litter as well. At uh, the end of the film. Yeah. Well, that was very interesting. So look, so we have Ty Carter on the set. Ty Carter, who went through all this. And, and I believe that that section of the film is pretty pristine in its accuracy because Ty Carter is telling us what he did and he did not do. He would tell us what, what hand he used to open a door, you know? Wow. But, but during the litter run, which is the same length, it, it, the, the outpost is pretty perfectly recreated with the exception of we, we didn't show the river that was there. Sure. But when they're carrying that litter, Ty told us that there was a point where he essentially stopped breathing, right? He, he could, but there's so much smoke in the air, he didn't want to bring in any more smoke into his lungs. And so, where, and so Ty hears this and knows how to manifest it as he's running to actually stop breathing as he's running. And you see that in the film. It's a very tiny moment, right? But it's perfect. And it's why the, one of the reasons that that, that performance is, um, is, is something very special to, to behold. Well, I think what, what really, the thing that, that really brought me back was, um, and talking about the point that you were just talking about, uh, when he came into the aid station, right? And he was so locked on to that, that litter that they basically had to smack yeah. his hand off of it. And then right. he collapsed underneath. That's right. And just, <gasps> yeah. Like then the finally he's right. taking his, right. you know, again, Dean, that, that comes completely from Ty Carter telling us what happened because that particular thing is not in the book. Right. That detail is not, is not in the book by Jake Tapper, by the way, Jake Tapper's book, the outpost may be one of the three or four best, books ever written about the American military and certainly the best book written about the Afghanistan war. Right. But um, when Ty told us that when he got there, they had to sort of unravel his fingers, you know, from around the, from around the poles of the stretcher. And it so happened that on the day that we shot that sequence, um, Chris Cordova, who was the doctor on the base and the doctor portrayed in the film happened to be on set with us. We invited him. Wow. To, to Bulgaria, and he um, and he took us and he confirmed it and took us through the paces of what what happened on on that day wow. in, in that room. And so we got really lucky. I mean, I'm telling you that the battle is the the first half of the film t um, has uh, very specific liberties, mostly in the conflations of commanders with this unit. But the second half of the film, which is basically the battle. Um, is as accurate as we possibly could to make it. Yeah. It was so fascinating to me. Now, and, and maybe it's just my misunderstanding, 
Um, now, one of the things that I missed is I didn't see other than um, some staff sergeants, um, you know, and, and, and the rank wasn't really important. It was more position, right. but I didn't see any first sergeants or like certain, what, was there a reason for that or was it the unit? I don't think that they had, the, they didn't have their first sergeant there on the, okay. day, on the battle. So it was just yeah. a contingent of the well, their squadron because they're a cab unit. What what right. you see what you see there is is pretty much what was going on with Bravo Troop three three six three okay. six one, okay. and um, the, you didn't see platoon leaders either. Right. Yep. We had a dearth of them as well. Okay. Right. And um, Bunderman was the only officer, uh, other than Captain Portis. I'm sorry, other than uh, Chris Cordova, the captain. Uh, on on the base when the, when that when the unit was being was being attacked, what happened in real life is that Broward, um, the fictionalized name Broward, right. um, was replaced. The new commander had come in. His name is Stony Portis, but a couple of days before the battle, he is um, he needs to go and uh, visit um, another FOB. He was going to go to FOB Bostic. And um, Ford Operating Base Bostic, and his his helicopter was shot at and was uh, disabled, and so he was stuck at Bostic when the battle began. So, in point of fact, Bunderman was the highest ranking person. Lieutenant Bunderman was the highest ranking person on the base when the attack occurred. Portis arrives on the mountain and takes. Um, and comes down with the uh, with the rapid response team, right? Uh, right down the mount down the mountain, and is killing bad guys along the way. And he has all his own heroism that uh, that we can discuss for which he received the Bronze Star. But um, yeah, it, it was th there was not a lot of chain of command leadership there. Um, there, you know, but the leadership of Romache, played by Scott Eastwood was really important and uh, Sergeant John Hill uh, was was very important and certainly Bunderman who just had uh, his award upgraded to the, the to the, the distinguished service class right well it was um, it was interesting you know um, because you were saying that um, you know uh, Scott Eastman's um, Eastwood. Or, or, yeah, Scott. Yeah, Eastman. Come on, you can't get that. Yeah, there, hey, I can remember this. Right? Um, so, right, absolutely. Eastwood. Sorry, slip of the tongue. Jeez, but uh, apologies to him. But talking about that is where that was really, you know, it was interesting to me because I was like, oh, looking at that, that senior enlisted where he kind of took control in a sense of that non commissioned officer. Yeah, kind of. Uh, you know, uh, making sure that, you know, the uh, sergeant of the guards were dealt with and kind of fell right into that role of a senior non-commissioned officer. And well, that, that, is, that is correct. And, um, you know, Romache, uh, uh, Romache, Clint Romache, um, uh, stepped up in every possible way. But that was expected of him. He was always known as a really good soldier. Right. It was uh, Carter, uh, Carter's behavior. That was the most shocking. Right, right. In sense nobody expected that from him. And, and, and by the way, The Outpost, the movie The Outpost, um, it's one of those rare films. Most films, you embellish and put things, extra things in to make it look even more heroic. But our movie, we, this was a 12-hour battle, and we'd show it in 45 minutes. So we right. had to take a lot out of that battle. Right. And, in right. point of fact, Carter and Romache did many, many more things in that battle. But you look at what they did in our movie, you go, oh, yeah, that person deserves the Medal of Honor. And right. then you realize that they actually received the Medal of Honor for doing far more than what is depicted right. in the movie. Right. Well, and it was, um, and, you know, and we didn't talk about this yet, but, you know, there was over an estimated 400 yeah. enemy combatants, right? And talking about, I, I love the aspect of when they were the they were in the up armored Humvee. He put up the the uh, binos and the hills were just crawling. They were coming right. down, right? Right. And, well, look, yeah, that's the thing that we really haven't discussed yet, uh, right? Yet, and that is that this movie deals with 
an outpost that was put at the bottom of the Hindu Kush mountains. Yeah. Surrounded completely. It was literally uh, tactically the worst place to put any base. And it was simply inevitable that at some point they would be overrun. Was, there were 53 fucking men there. <laughs> 53. That's just crazy. And, 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 and I'll tell you something else. Really important, Dean. Most of the movies that you see about these wars, like, okay, what are the most famous movies from the Afghan-Iraq war? Well, to you, what are the main ones? Uh, good Lord. Now you're going to put me on the spot. I well, what's happening, all, all your people are yelling at the screen right now. They're saying, American Sniper. Well, right, Sniper. There you go. Okay. Sniper. So, yeah. Right? You know, um, 12 Strong. You know, all these movies are about whom? They're about the SEALs. They're about snipers. They're about rangers. They're about right. special forces. Special operations. These yeah. guys were what you're talking about. They're the Joes. Yeah. All these guys just want to go home. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, they're they're arguing with their wives. They they want to. Their wives want them out. They want to come back. They want to go right. work at the automotive store. They want to go uh, raise a family. They want to go back to college. They want to do whatever. But you know, that's not their lives. They they're they're not the elite units. And so these 53 regular Joes are now, ha it's like the Battle of Thermopylae. I mean, right. they, they're, they you know, go tell the Spartans, man. And so, so the, what, in the beginning of the film where Scott Eastwood, son of Clint Eastwood, <laughs> I'm not going to put that one down. Yeah, I know. You, you, you are, you are, you are American, <laughs> He's, there's nothing more American than Clint Eastwood. I got it tattooed on my arm now. We're good. Okay, good. So <laughs> looking up at that, looking up at that mountain, you look down and say, as an audience, you understand what's going on. Right. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting. When I was at West Point, my squad leader, another cadet, was probably the, one of the best cadets that have ever roamed that the plains of West Point. His name was Mick Nicholson. And he was a hard ass. And almost drove me out of the academy. And he's the one, but he's the one who, as a colonel, created these outposts, hmm. you know. And um, so it was a little weird for me to make this film for that reason. But th there was a reason for the creation of these outposts. They, okay. it, it was, was counterinsurgency. It was sure. they wanted to be close to the villages and make nice with the villagers. And, and there was a supply route that it was cutting off from Pakistan to, uh, to the Taliban in, um, in Afghanistan. But the reasons, although they existed, were not good enough. Because what I, I mean, the outpost was destroyed in point of fact. I mean, we won the battle uh, in, in technically. I mean, we lost eight people, which is horrible. It's horrible. Right. Um, they lost like 250 men. Right. You know, so in terms of, but, but you know, in the end, to what end? You know, okay. That's a, that's a, that's a body count for a victory. So, but you know, but I gotta say, you look at that film and you say, this is what the American soldier can do. This is what we're fucking all about. Fills me with great pride. It fills me with great pride that these guys, the reason they died was they wanted to keep their buddy alive. There were these three guys that got into one of the Humvees to drive over to the Humvee that's being targeted to try to help them and get those guys out of there. And um, all but one of those guys to, got killed. It's horrible. But they got killed trying to save somebody else. And so at the end of the film, when you see this memorial, right at the end, it's very sad. But people also told me it was very inspirational. You know, it's what they were willing to die for, you know, for their fellow guy. And I know it sounds corny, Dean, but you're a soldier, so you know that it's not corny. That's very real. Right, right. Well, one of the things I was going to ask you, Rod, is, you know, you talk about the, lo the, the outpost location. Right. In your research, did you ever find out exactly why it was located? In well, it, it, yes, it, it's what I said before. It was they wanted to be close to these uh, to various villages that they could, uh, 
you know, forge a relationship with and to cut off that supply route. Okay. So, the, you know, so that was pretty clear. But as I said, right. you know, it wasn't a good enough reason. Uh, no. <laughs> that does, I think any, anybody could have. But, you know, at and, the same time, it's... Uh, and, and there were, there were, to be honest with you, a couple of other uh, fobs that had similar attacks on them. Uh, you know, like there was one called Wanat, which was, you know, thoroughly attacked as well. Another very heroic, heroic uh, battle. Well, let's be really honest with this is because, you know, the history of Afghanistan, because you know, we're talking about Afghanistan here, and, and we go back before the Battle of Kamdesh, before Americans ever entered. Let's go back to the Russian occupation. Right. Uh, and a lot of the uh, combat outposts, the, uh, you know, forward operating bases were, a lot of them were former Russian outposts. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, that's not the case with Keating. Keating was built from the, right. from the bottom up. And I'm not really familiar with what you're talking about. Sure. But, you know, what I do know is that, is that Russia suffered a horrible fate. Yep. Uh, being there, it's you know that the country is as as they call it is the burial the burial ground of empires. Well, and it, the reason that I bring that up is because, um, for example, um, the the uh, outpost that I was at, um, the uh, it actually what happened at Kamdesh actually happened to the Russians. Um, in the region that I was in. Oh, and, that okay. Yeah, and where the weapons were turned down on them from their own observation posts and kind of the worst case scenario happened for them. What, 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 what I will tell you, Dean, is that um, these men that were at this outpost, especially on a platoon by platoon basis, yeah. remain to this day, 11 years later. Today is the, the day that you're, yeah. you're posting this is the uh, 11th anniversary. Right. These men are very very close to one another still right they love each other i mean it's it's really it's really something to to behold right you know the the um this battle forged them in a, you know in a way that they will never be unforged right absolutely no i completely understand that it's uh you know certainly bonding a brotherhood that you can't uh really find anywhere else right so right it's, it's unique correct. so i would say it's totally correct yeah so um, so let's talk a little bit about the aftermath, talking about the, we, you know, of course we talked about the, um, uh, the body count, but, um, I wanted to talk more about, they had, uh, two medal of honors, uh, yeah. numerous silver stars, bronze stars. Yeah. And some of them have been, two of them have been upgraded to, to the distinguished service cross. Oh, they have. Or, okay. Yeah, Sar uh, Sergeant Gallegos and Lieutenant Bunderman. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, many, many numerous. Uh, the most decorated battle of the uh, of the Afghanistan war. Right. And um, this may uh, this may end up being, after all, said the most decorated unit of the Afghanistan war. I mean, it, it was it, the just one act of heroism and selfless heroism after another, and you know we really had to um, to pick and choose. I mean, right. it, you know there are. I've apologized to many men uh, from this battle because I couldn't tell their story. And the truth is that um, they really deserve uh, to have their, 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 really deserve to have their stories told. And it's, it's unfortunate uh, that that never came to pass. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I reached out to you uh, directly was because you know, the premise of the show, right? Um, not only educating and bringing awareness um, to others, um, but one of the things is, is telling veterans stories. And these men that went through this, um, mm -hmm. you know, talking about these heroics that happened. And we talk about all these uh, tremendous uh, soldiers that, that right. faced that atrocity, I think they talked about uh, where heaven and hell meet, right? And uh, well, there was... Carter talks about that. The real Ty yeah. Carter. Talks yeah. And uh, talking about uh, during the battle of kind of, uh, kind of where, where, where hell would be. And then, um, so it's kind of crazy. And I, I think it ties back to the aspect because it really focuses in on... Um, uh, 
where Scott Eastwood, right? <laughs> he looks up on the bunk and it says it's not, or it doesn't get any better. Right. And that, you know, it kind of really sets a tone of like, Hey, you're kind of, <laughs> you're but what I like about it does. It doesn't get better. Right. is that you can look at it in, in two ways. One is you're in a shithole and it's never going to get any better than this, which is a negative. And then there's a prop, the popular expression, man, it doesn't get better than this. Right. It isn't great. You know, right. like when you're in, in, in Hawaii making love to your beautiful wife. Right. It doesn't get better than this, right? And that could apply there also because – the, the friendships and the brotherhood, it, it, it doesn't get better than that. My best friends in life are still people that I went to West Point with because, because I was never served in combat, my experience at West Point was the most stressful experience of my life. And those stressful experiences that you go through with others are um, the ones that forge the best relationships. Yeah. You know, uh, at, at West Point, right, it's, um, it's a classically difficult school to, to attend because you're 18 years old when you come in and uh, n most of us uh, have never been in service of any kind and you not only have the most difficult academics in the world, you've also got a very difficult leadership training and very difficult physical training. So, but, but that first summer, it's called Beast Barracks. It's when really the hell descends down upon you the most. And, P and it's a very stressful time. But cadets will tell you that the most stressful time is not beast barracks. They will tell you the most stressful time is when you're taking finals, your final exams. And the reason for that is, is this. When you're taking your final exams, you're on your own. In fact, you're in competition with others. Okay, you're on your own. There's no one there to help you other than yourself. Right. When you're in beast barracks, you're counting on one another. Okay. And that relieves the stress a little bit when you know that somebody has your back. Right. And so these, these stress periods are the ones that create the best friendships, you know, and that they last for life. That's why I asked you if you kept in touch with those guys, because I've noticed that the guys from the battle of Kandesh have remained extraordinarily close and a lot of the families of the of the dead are very close with one another to this day right very interesting you know it's uh, i was going to bring that up and i'm glad that you did talking about shared hardships mm -hmm. that just uh you know regardless of what your experience is um, whether it's combat or something else in training whatever uh forges that it brings people close and it brings a that team mentality as well right so you can't really outclass anybody that has shared hardships together if you have a group of individuals well, uh, well Dean, look i know that we're close to being done here and i right. in, in our conversation and and i don't want to necessarily end on a on a, on a, on a buzz kill <laughs> But, I, but I, let me address right. what, what you're saying in, in this way and tell you how much I can relate to it. So um, when I was in preparation on this film, what we call PrEP in Bulgaria, um, I got the word that uh, my son Hunter was in a hospital in Michigan. And um, the nurse told me that he, was, he had been at a music festival and that he had a cardiac arrest, and um, that I can come back if I want to, uh, but he's not going to make it. And you can only do you have kids, Steve? I do. You do. How old are they? Uh, my son is nine, and a daughter fourteen. And you love them more than anything. Absolutely. And I love my son so much, and he's my best friend. He was twenty-seven, and I. I got to, from Bulgaria to this Muskegon, Michigan, you know, as quickly as I possibly could. And I got there just in time. You know, he was still alive. He was unconscious. He was hooked up to every machine known to man, uh, literally every organ attached to a different machine. 
And um, his, my ex-wife and I, his mother, made the decision that we had to unplug him, and we did. And um, my daughter Paige, she says to me, "You know, Dad, I I know this is, uh, I I know that uh, you feel right now like you can't go make this film, but you have to go make this film." And I called up the studio, and I they were already making their list of who's going to replace me. And um, I called them and I said, I'm coming back. I want to make the movie my way, though, to get out of my way. Mm-hmm. And um, what happened was that the families of the fallen got behind me, Dean, mm-hmm. in ways that you can't imagine, with love and with sincerity and with appreciation and great. And uh, they're my family now. You know, and I, I realized that Hunter was the same age as all these guys, Thompson, Gallegos, you know, Scusa, Thompson, you know, the, the rest of them. I'm, um, and um, it, it was, it, we did forge together, you know, and I, it altered the film and it altered how I depicted the deaths of these men and, and so on. And so, no, you know, I wasn't in combat, but I, but I understand mutual loss. And it's, um, it became like a really important part of the film. And uh, when you see the film, you know, the film, is, the film honors the men, but is dedicated to my son, Hunter, Hunter Lurie. So it's, well, uh, that's buzzkilly, I know, but it's a point that I, that. Right. Uh, well, and, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I, you, brought, you bring it up as, as a buzzkill, but it's, I think it, it was something that I was going to bring up towards the end anyways, and thank you for doing that. And, and of course, my condolences to you on, on the loss of Hunter. And, um, but what a beautiful tribute. And I, and I love the, the, the view that you talked about of saying, you know, your son was uh, you know around the age look, look. of a lot of these guys so uh, yes L- let me end on this my we showed the film to the families uh, last october and um about a year ago and um jay tapper the cnn correspondent host who's about as tough as they come as an interviewer was rattled and so was I before the film began, because we didn't know, we flew all the families in. We did not know how they were going to react to this film. Did not know. And there was a lot of tears and it was difficult for them, but they understood something, which is this. They say that you die twice. Once when you leave this earth, the second time when the last person ever speaks your name. And what we gave their sons and their husbands, uh, their boyfriends, their children, brothers, their sisters, their friends, was the knowledge that with our film, their names will be spoken forever. And so will Hunter's. And that is the, the one, people who have lost children, and there are people watching this who have, they, I think that, you know, we are, they, our children are supposed to be our legacy, right. not the other way around. And Joe Biden in his book, um, I Promise Me Dad, talks about the death of his son, Bo, and that the death of his son, Bo, gave him a sense of purpose. And we have to have purpose or we will wither away. And this movie gave me purpose. It kept me, I, I don't know if I'd be here, Dean, if I didn't have this film and if I didn't have those families. So, you know, um, uh, on a large level, one of the reasons I want to do this film is so that veterans could turn to their families and say, you see, that's what it was like. But on a human level, on a one-to-one level with these families, the only thing I could give them is that forevermore their, their loved ones' names will be spoken. That's beautiful. 
beautifully said. I don't, uh, I don't want to muck it up with all my uh, rambling. That's uh, I can't add to anything. That's just, and thank you, Rod, for you know for, for 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 doing that in in a time of crisis, but providing a platform so their voices can continue. And Dean, really, thank and thank you, Dean, for having this podcast. There are very few podcasts that are, are dedicated to this sort of thing. And it's been a privilege to be on with you. And, um, you know, I hope that people see this. I hope that people see our film. It's on Netflix now, or if you, if you want, you can buy it on DVD and, and Blu-ray. Um, and, and by the way, everyone watch through the credits because I don't know if you did that. Dean. I did. I did. You did the credits. You see, you'll see the real men. You'll see them interviewed. It's yep. becomes, the credits become a sort of a documentary sequence about what happened. It's, it's awesome. So thank you so much. Our guest today, Rod Lurie. Rod, thank you again for being a guest today. It is uh, just a tremendous honor having you on. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, continue doing what you're doing. Continue sharing Absolutely. some stories of healing and empowerment. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> thank All you, right. Dean. All you right, cheers. <laughs>